Good afternoon. The time has come for all waiting for. Now we are looking for a wonderful lecture from two people. So let me introduce myself. My name is Madhu Madhavan. I am a member of the San Diego Indian American Society. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you on behalf of the San Diego Indian American Society to this 28th annual Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Lecture and Awards. We have today two very distinguished people of San Diego, and we are very, very fortunate to have them here. They have to make a lot of arrangements to be here together on this particular day. These two people have done remarkable things in their life, and I'm going, not going to enumerate everything except to say the first one was recently uh, mentioned in an article in Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. So Dr. Ramachandran is that person. <clears throat> and uh, Congressman Dr. Bob Fellner, many people do not know he is a doctor. He was a professor also. And he has been very much admired by a lot of people in this country, particularly people who are, in, who are veterans. As a member of the Veterans Committee, and as recently as the chairman of the Veterans Committee, Veterans Committee of the U.S. Congress, he was able to help them a lot. And he is remembered for his great contribution for that segment of the society, even though he is totally opposed to war. Rama, as the token of our <coughs> As a token of our appreciation and admiration for your research, that we would like to offer you a golden shawl in the Indian tradition. <laughs> Bob, as a mark of our gratitude to you for all that you have done for us over the last 22 years by giving uh, the United States Congress certificates to our scholars, and other help you have given me, we would like to offer you the shawl too. <laughs> he says I am under arrest for bribing a federal official. <laughs> <clears throat> The annual Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Scholarship and Awards uh, is the longest running one in the United States. It was originally inaugurated by late Dr. Jonas Salk. Since the time we have given this scholarship for nearly 500 students, these scholarships were completely funded by people of India origin. And we would like to encourage Many of you in the audience, if you would like to do that, to support our activities by opening up your wallets. And we'll be glad to accept it, whatever form you give. <clears throat> so please think about it and uh, try to support us if you can. <clears throat> Before I introduce the congressman today, I would like to recognize three important people in the audience, in my judgment. There are so many of you, but these, these three people have done so much for the organization. <clears throat> One is Dr. Suresh Subramani. Suresh Subramani was, elect, was appointed as the executive vice chancellor of UCSD, one of the highest honors people can possibly have. Suresh, wonderful congratulations. <clears throat> the other person is also known over here for a long time. He is Ramu Ramanathan. And he was recently elected to the Swedish Academy of, uh, Royal Academy of Sciences as a member of the committee. So th congratulations, Rahul. <laughs> it's better to know him. He can actually nominate people for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and the third person, of course, you may not like what I'm going to tell you about him, that is Ramesh Rao. 
and Ramesh is the one who has done so much for us over all these years, we would not be here today without his help. Ramesh is the director of Call IT2. Ramesh, thank you very much. <laughs> Congressman Bob Filner is known to me for a long period of time, almost for 40 years, when he became a member of the San Diego State University. After his graduation from Cornell University, and he's joined the um, San Diego Studies in 1970. Perhaps the more important thing in his life before that is, he's one of the very few people who become the freedom riders in 1961. By choosing this action, he was jailed for two months, and then he was able to get out, and then he believes in that. His interest in um, nonviolence goes back to a very long period of time. And he has not changed the iota from that particular conviction he has about nonviolence. Whenever we talk about uh, things such as war, he say, do you think Gandhi would have approved it? So that is the kind of approval he would seek before he inter uh, interests himself in anything to do with war. So this guy has done a lot of things, and more importantly for San Diego, since 1979, he's an elected official. And he has done very much for the San Diego education system as a member of the education board. And he was also a member of the city council, deputy mayor of that. And as the congressman of San United States, he has done a lot of things for the district where he is elected from. And so let me in, uh, please join me in welcoming and inviting Congressman Bob Filner to say his remarks. Thank you, Madhu. Uh, we're not old enough to have known each other 40 years, but uh, <laughs> when I first got to San Diego State as a faculty member, we had offices right across the hall from each other. And uh, I learned much from him, thank you. And uh, we have continued that friendship ever since. And of course, now we've reached the height of what a San Diego State University professor aspires to, and that is to teach at UCSD. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, I, I have, uh, as uh, Madhu pointed out, uh, been associated with the teachings of Gandhi for a long time. I had the honor of uh, meeting Dr. King when I was 13 years old and uh, read everything he did, but his mentor was uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and I read everything that Gandhi had done and uh, became a follower ever since of a nonviolent uh, of a nonviolent philosophy. Uh, of course, I'm not even in the top hundred influentials in my own family because uh, I uh, I never even touched my kids, which probably was a mistake. I'm not sure about that. But what did Gandhi say about that? <laughs> uh, clearly. Uh, that I think that philosophy is even more relevant today than uh, than ever, as we watch uh, you know the so-called uh, Arab Spring in the uh, in, in the Middle East, with the uh, the events there that are going on, the pro-democratic uh, events, we are, are seeing peaceful demonstrations turn uh, uh, overthrow governments. That's incredible. Uh, and when I was uh, involved in the civil rights movement based on that philosophy. Uh, we changed America. I mean, we didn't make America perfect, but we changed American history by being involved. Uh, this year happens to be the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. And we've had, uh, uh, we've had reunions and celebrations around the country. Uh, and uh, I, I was just back in Jackson, Mississippi, where I spent two months in, in the state penitentiary. I saw the cell I was in and was in tears because you know that changed my life where I was for in a little six by nine uh, uh, cell for a couple months. But uh, we were greeted by the first black mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. We were protected by the first black police chief who was also female uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. So we saw a change. And I, I recall I was the uh, super delegate that just happened to be able to put uh, um, in, at the National Democratic National Convention in 2008 to put uh, 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 Barack Obama over the top as the nominee. And 50 years before, I had been sitting in jail trying to get a cup of coffee in an integrated 
uh, to, to integrate the uh, bus station there. So we have come a long way. But as Dr. King would say, and I'm sure Gandhi would say, we have a long way to go. And uh, certainly I will continue that in whatever position I'm in as an advocate for nonviolent but direct action uh, for change in America. But change comes in a lot of ways. It comes through intellectual activity as well as political action. And we have one of the most foremost makers of change in the world today. And I'm privileged and honored to be here to introduce uh, one of the greatest pioneers in neuroscience, uh, Dr. V.S. Ramachandran. It's such an honor to be here uh, with you. I think you know he's a, a world-renowned brain researcher. He's his deceptively simple and original experiments have often had profound impact on many fields of inquiry, ranging from practical applications for neurological rehabilitation to the mysteries of consciousness and art. His contribution to humankind has been described variously uh, as ingenious, elegant, and original by a Nobel laureate, David Hubel, and the Marco Polo of neuroscience. I'm not sure of that one myself, as I, uh, uh, but uh, as we will forget the, any imperialism that's, uh, that's, that's in there. Uh, his research on uh, visual illusions ha uh, has opened up new areas of investigations in such diverse fields as visual physiology, artificial intelligence, psychology, and philosophy. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to speak on these issues, not just as a politician, but my doctorate is in the history of science, uh, where I taught for 20 years. So uh, I'm, I, I, at least I know the meanings of those words if I can't keep up with what you have, <laughs> have done, doctor. Uh, he is most widely known for work on uh, visual filling in and especially for groundbreaking research on the clinical phenomenon of phantom limbs. His critically acclaimed work on uh, phantoms in the brain has been uh, translated into nine languages at last count and formed the basis for at least two celebrated documentaries, uh, one on PBS. Dr. Ramachandran has received many international honors and awards. Uh, in 2005, for example, he was awarded the most prestigious Henry Dale Prize and elected to an honorary life fellowship by the Royal Institution of Great Britain. Now, I don't know how he does this, but in his addition to his scientific interests, and if you caught his, uh, his, uh, his desk book uh, while he was setting up his thing, you know he has wide-ranging interests. We got that, Mr. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're, if you try to run for office, we have stuff on you. Uh, <laughs> he pursues, for example, Indology, Archaeology, Ethnology, and Paleontology in his spare time. So, uh, and, the, gov and uh, the government of India has conferred the prestigious Padna Bhusan Award just uh, in, in this year. So, we admire you, if I may say, Rama, and uh, for your dedication to the pursuit of knowledge. And please join me in welcoming Professor V.S. Ramachandran. Thank you for that amazing introduction. I feel very, very honored to be here. Also honored to be here giving the Gandhi Memorial Lecture. Uh, Gandhi has long been a, a hero of mine, although the word hero is a bit of an <laughs> understatement for somebody like Gandhi. And I think he was truly a man of God, if I might use that phrase. And I can no, do no better than to quote Einstein, who said of Gandhi, I don't have an exact quote here, but I, I remember it roughly as something along these lines. Generations to come will scarce believe that such a man as this ever walked in flesh and blood upon this earth. That was Einstein talking about Gandhi. So in addition, I'd like to thank uh, Madhu Madhavan, who has done a great deal for the Indian community here. As Indians, we are individually uh, aware of our glorious cultural her heritage and our traditions. But Madhu, I think, brought us all together to celebrate this tradition and also increase the awareness of this tradition among not just Indians, but among uh, Americans here in San Diego. And by organizing events like this, I think he has really got us all together. So thank you, Madhu. <laughs> and in a sense, he has made Gandhian, made us all respect Gandhian values more. I mean, he's not, not always successfully, but uh, try, he tries hard. <laughs> Um, but I'm not here to talk about Gandhi today. I'm not a Gandhi scholar. There are a number of recent books that have come out. 
some better than others, but about the human brain. But I will touch on the issues of how compassion and culture might emerge from the activity of cells in the brain. Um, now just think about what's involved here. Pause for a second and ask yourself what's the question. Here is a, a lump of jelly, three kilograms, which is consistency of tofu. And you can hold it in the palm of your hand. And it can contemplate the vastness of interstellar space, the meaning of infinity, the meaning of God, uh, contemplate the meaning of love, of charity, of piety. It can even contemplate itself contemplating, what we call self-awareness or introspection. How, do all this, how does all this come about from this lump of tofu you can carry in your hand? That's truly astonishing that we take it for granted the, 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 this decade of the brain, decade of neuroscience, with all the te technology that dominates brain research, we forget what the basic question is. How does this miraculous, uh, how does a miracle occur of neurons, activity of nerve cells in the brain, giving rise to conscious experience? Um, now, I'm not going to pretend that, so even though many aspects of human nature are, we're going to begin to understand in the decades to come by studying the brain, I'm not going to pretend we're going to understand it all, such as the idea of ahimsa, Gandhian ideals, higher ideals, lofty ideals of man. Uh, do, they, how, how do, they arise, do they indeed arise entirely from the brain? These are philosophical questions. And I tend to remain agnostic. Uh, I have a Platonist view of this. You know, Plato believed there is a, another parallel realm of existence where these ideas and ideals and values have an independent existence from the physical world and from physical reality. Of course, this is not a scientific question, it's a metaphysical question, but I tend to personally lean in that direction. Even though I'm a hardcore neuroscientist, I think human values have an absolute existence. Now, don't tell any of my colleagues I said that. <laughs> so I'm not here to explain Gandhi's brain, but the functions of the average human brain and how it works. And our approach to this question, uh, so what is the question? To, to repeat, the brain is made up of 100 billion nerve cells. Oops, how do I start this? How do I start this? Sorry. Yeah. The brain is made up of nerve cells, which are the basic structural and functional units of the nervous system. Can people at the back hear me okay? Yes? I guess you can now. <laughs> uh, it's made up of 100 billion nerve cells, which are the structural and functional units of the nervous system. And each nerve cell makes something like 1,000 to 10,000 contacts with other nerve cells. And each point of contact is called a synapse. It can be either off or on, it can be inhibitory, it can be excitatory. Someone has figured out that the number of possible brain states, permutations and combinations of brain activity, exceeds the number of elementary particles in the known universe. And this gives you some idea of the complexity we're dealing with in studying the, in the human brain. So people often ask me, is it really true that we only use, when I give these lectures, is it, only, is it true that we use only 10% of the brain, Dr. Ramachandran? And I say there's absolutely no truth to this, this myth, uh, except in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you go about studying uh, the brain? There are many techniques you can use. One is brain imaging, which is very popular these days, where you make the person perform some action, and then measure the activity of the brain using fMR, functional magnetic resonance imaging, or PET scans, and find out what parts of the brain are specialized to deal with that function. Right? Okay, excellent. Thank you. We, we, we need to, uh, so that's one technique, brain imaging. Another technique, the one we use to a large extent, is we, look, we do what's called behavioral neurology or cognitive neuroscience. Look at patients who have had a change or sustained an injury to a small portion of the brain and producing characteristic changes in their mind or their behavior and trying to correlate structure and function. Uh, and I'll give you, we don't have much time, I'll give you one or two striking examples of this. Uh, one example is, uh, what we call prosopagnosia. If you look at the temporal lobes, okay, there we are. If you look at the temporal lobes of the brain, so the brain has frontal lobes, parietal lobes, which receives touch signals, among other things, and constructs an image of the body in, in, wa walking around the world in the superior, oops, this region called the superior parietal lobule here. So that's the touch area of the brain. If you go to the temporal lobes, there's a region in the medial in inside of the temporal lobes inner bottom surface of the temporal lobe is called the fusiform gyrus. That region of the brain is concerned with seeing people's faces. 
and it's specialized for that function. And you know this because when you have damage, I don't know how you get this to work. When you have damage to that structure, the fusiform gyrus, you get a patient who's completely normal in, in most respects. He's articulate, intelligent, alert, attentive, memory for most, is completely normal. You read him a book, an hour later, you ask him what, what was read to him, he'll, he'll tell you, tell you what, what, what was read to him. But he has one profound problem, and that is he can no longer recognize people's faces. Now, he's not blind because he can read a book, fine, or he can name the colors of objects, fine, but he cannot recognize you from looking at your face. Now, it's not that he can't see your face. If you ask him to sketch it, if he's a good artist, he'll produce a sketch of the face. He'll even tell you what the expression of the face is. What eludes him is the identity of the face. Who is this person? Have I seen this person before? That's completely gone. He may even look at his mother and say, who is this woman? He may even look at his own mirror image reflection and say, who, you know, I know it's me because it's a mirror. He's not stupid. But he says, it doesn't look like me. I don't know who it is. So this suggests that this region of the brain, the fusiform gyrus, is specialized for recognizing faces, primarily. It turns out that another region of the fusiform gyrus is also involved in seeing color, processing color information, very tiny patch of brain tissue. A student of mine, Dave Brang, has been studying this region of the brain using brain imaging. And right next to it, there's another area specialized for seeing shapes of numbers, graphemes. Can you imagine this, that seeing numbers, shapes of numbers is, is, is achieved by a relatively small region in the fusiform gyrus of the brain. Now. This takes me to another syndrome we've been studying called synesthesia, where this is not a syndrome in the sense you see it in normal people. Who are, you see it, in fact, in 1%, 2% of the general population. There are probably two or three of you here in the general population who have synesthesia but haven't come out. And that is a condition where people look at numbers and they see colors every time you see a number. So five is red, six is chartreuse, seven is indigo, nine is blue, and so on and so forth. And every number has its own color. This has been known since the time of Francis Galton in the 19th century, that people regarded it as a curiosity or an anomaly. Nobody really studied it. We, we started studying it about 10 years ago and said these people are not crazy. There is a specific reason, there's some reason why this is happening in the brain. And we showed that because the number area and color area are right next to each other in the brain, in the fusiform gyrus, in some people there is some accidental cross-wiring. So every time you see a particular number, it activates not only a neuron specialized for detecting that number, but cross-activates a color neuron. So every time you see a number, you see a color. Now you say, okay, you're studying this. What, what's the big deal? Why should I care about it? Well, it turns out synesthesia, which is numbers being seen as colors or tones being associated with colors, like F sharp is blue, C sharp is green, and so on and so forth, is about eight times more common among artists, poets, and novelists than in the general population. Right? Why would that be? OK, so let's ask about why synesthesia occurs in the first place. Why would some people see numbers as colored? And I said it's because of cross-wiring between number and color areas in the brain. But why would the cross-wiring occur in some people? Galton, in the 19th century, showed that it runs in families, so there may be a genetic basis. So what I argued was, in the infant brain, in all of us, when you're little babies, when you're infants, or even in your fetus, everything is connected to everything. There's a tremendous redundancy of connections in the brain. And as the fetal brain develops into childhood and later adulthood, the excess connections are pruned away by pruning genes. This creates a characteristic modular architecture of the adult brain. So you have a specialized region for number and color and faces and so on and so forth. Now, if there's a defect in this pruning gene, so there is defective pruning, what happens is adjacent regions get linked up together. So there's cross-wiring, excess redundant connections between adjacent brain regions. Therefore, every time you see a number, it automatically cross-activates a color neuron, and you see a color. Now. So what? Okay, so we've shown that there is this quirky phenomenon, and we've shown what the neural basis is. But what's the broader significance? Well, it turns out synesthesia is about eight times more common among artists, poets, and novelists. I just said that. So why would that be? Well, imagine if this gene, instead of being expressed selectively in the fusiform to produce cross-activation, was expressed more diffusely throughout the brain. So there's greater cross-activation and cross-linkage between distant, remote regions of the brain. That creates a greater propensity to li link seemingly uh, unrelated ideas and concepts. If you, if you assume ideas and concepts uh, are also localized in different regions of the brain, and there are, there's evidence for this, then if they have excess cross connections, you get a greater propensity to link seemingly unrelated ideas. And that's the basis of creativity and metaphor. As when Shakespeare said, it is the yeast and Juliet is the sun. You don't immediately say, Juliet is the sun. Does that mean she's a glowing ball of fire? Your brain instantly recognizes it's a metaphor, 
And you say, no, it means she's radiant like the sun. She's warm like the sun. She's nurturing like the sun. She's celestial like the sun. <laughs> you can make all these links in your brain spontaneously. And creative people, artists, poets, and novelists are especially good at that. That's why the synesthesia gene is seven or eight times more common among artistic, poetic types. Right? That's the hidden agenda of the gene. Now, of course, if it's expressed selectively in the fusiform, it produces this quirk called synesthesia. But that's not the hidden evolutionary ag agenda. <coughs> hidden evolutionary agenda is to make some, a subset of the population more creative and artistic. Now, you say, well, if this gene is that good, makes people creative and artistic and metaphorical, why doesn't everybody have it? Well, that's, as any evolutionary biologist knows, a stupid question because evolution takes time. Maybe another few thousand years from now, we'll all have the synesthesia gene. And we'll all be creative and, and uh, metaphorical. But the, true, the real answer is you don't want everybody to be metaphorical and creative. If there is a neurosurgeon performing surgery on your brain, you don't want him getting metaphorical on you. Okay? <laughs> so you need a diverse spectrum of talent and abilities in the population which may be that, that that's why this gene is not seen in every member of the population. Sorry about that. Okay, so this gives you some idea of the strategy we use in approaching brain function. There's another disorder we have studied, which is even more curious, which actually I, I did with uh, my uh, wife and colleague, uh, Diane, but also with uh, my grad student, David Brang, and Paul McGeer, who's a postdoc in my lab, he's a surgeon. And for a long time it's been known there's a disorder called apotemnophilia. We've just started studying this, so you take this with a generous pinch of salt. The other syndromes I've been taking you have been studying for years, and we know it's been replicated by many labs, so we know it's for sure. But here we're skating on thin ice. They're 90% sure, not 100% sure. I thought I should mention that first. So disorder called apotemnophilia, the, the syndrome was clearly legitimate. It exists, and we have studied them, and it's clearly valid syndrome. That is, some people who are otherwise perfectly normal, and have been normal their entire lives, have held a, a reasonable job, have had families, everything is normal about them. In fact, I knew a, a dean of a, an engineering school once who had the syndrome. Not that that proves he's normal, but he had the syndrome. And that is, he wanted to have his arm amputated. He said he had an abhorrence for his arm his entire life. He's had this problem for the entire life. He always wanted to have his arm removed. He never told anybody because it sounds ridiculous. But now that he's re retired, he wanted, he wanted the surgeon to remove his arm. It's not ethical to do this in this country. So many of these people go to Canada or go to Mexico to get it done, actually get it done. About one-third the people who develop this, this syndrome of apotemnophilia actually go and get their arm amputated or leg amputated. Now, why would this happen? There are all kinds of bizarre theories, Freudian theories, about apotemnophilia. One popular theory, believe it or not, you're not going to believe this. One popular Freudian theory is, you have your arm amputated, this guy wants to have his arm amputated, to create an amputation stump that resembles a giant penis. And this is kind of Freudian wish fulfillment that they're engaging in, in having an amputation done. Now this is complete nonsense, of course. And we started thinking about this, why would somebody who's perfectly sane say he's, he's, the arm is abhorrent, he wants it removed, and so on and so forth. I said, does the arm feel like it doesn't belong to you? He said, no, not really. It feels like it's intrusive. It's sort of, not, not that it doesn't belong to me. It feels intrusive or abhorrent. I don't know why. I want it removed. And after they get it removed, the depression goes away. They become completely normal, except they don't have an arm. Right? Mentally and uh, emotionally, they they're become much more happy and quote-unquote normal. So we discovered what happens here, to cut a long story short, there is a complete map of the body surface on the surface of the brain in the postcentral gyrus here. Your entire left side of the body so here's the left side of the brain. The entire right side of the body is mapped onto the postcentral gyrus. All the skin, blood, the skin and muscles and proprioception, tendons, everything's represented in the somatosensory cortex. Here, and there's a complete map of the body surface and the surface of the brain. So our first hunch was, maybe this map is congenitally missing the arm. That's why it doesn't feel like the arm is part of it. But remember what he tells you. You, you often learn a hell of a lot by just listening to the patient for five minutes but then by doing hundreds of uh, uh, sophisticated, uh, using sophisticated technology, hundreds of measurements. He says, no, the arm does belong to me. It feels like it belongs to me, but it feels like it over belongs to me. It's intrusive. And corresponding to that, we went and looked at the map in S1, somatosensory cortex, and the map was completely intact. There was nothing wrong with it. We said, well, there goes that theory. But then behind it, there's a region called, there's a region called inferior superior parietal lobule, 
where you construct what you call your body image. So I close my eyes and I have a vivid sense of my entire body, my arms and muscles and where I'm moving as I navigate through space, sense of my body, my head and everything. That's constructed using partly my vision when my eyes are open, partly hearing, partly my muscle and tendons, partly from skin, from all the difference in vestibular sense. All of that converges on to this region of the brain. Superior parietal lobule, from vision, from touch, from hearing, all of that converges there to construct your body image. Now that body image is constructed by largely it's a genetic scaffolding is laid down by genes. But in this chap, or these chaps, I should say, which has done several patients, this region of the brain This reason the body image center is missing that arm representation. So this sensory representation of the arm is intact, but it sends a signal to the body image center in the brain. We use multiple signals to construct a body image. That center does not have a representation of the arm. So the signals get there, and the brain says, well, there's nothing happening here. Where, where do I go? Put it, put it crudely. And this tremendous discrepancy is picked up by a region called the insula cortex, which is buried in the folds of the brain here, which is sensitive to discrepancies, and it arouses you and makes you uh, anxious, depressed, and try to avoid whatever is causing the anxiety. And that the brain then says, or you say, I want the arm removed. So here's an example of a very complex neuropsychiatric disorder, which people came up with all kinds of weird Freudian explanations. But somebody is saying, I want my arm removed. Sounds completely nuts. But you go and look at the brain, in fact, there's a specific reason, physiological reason why the patient experiences this. Now, before I go on to the, the next section of my talk, I'm going to say a little bit about another major discovery that's been made, not by our lab, but a lab in Italy, by Giacomo Rizzolari. And this is a group of neurons. OK, let's go back to why doesn't this work anymore? OK, let's go back to the somatosensory cortex where you get sensations. In front of it, there's a motor cortex here. The motor cortex is involved in sending commands to the body. And then there's premotor cortex here. Right? This generates commands. So this has been known for over 50 years. And when I reach out and grab a peanut or grab a lever or push something, different neurons in the motor cortex start firing. So there's a neuron in the front of the brain, the frontal lobes, in the premotor cortex which generate commands like reach out and grab a peanut, push that pillow, pull that lever, different command neurons for different commands. These orchestrate the sequence of muscle twitches required to perform that semi-skilled action. This has been known for a long time. They're called motor command neurons. But recently, not that recently, about a decade ago, Giacomo Rizzolari found that some of these neurons, so here's a neuron that's telling the monkey or the person, reach out and grab a peanut. So that's a command neuron. Some of these command neurons will fire, not only when the monkey reaches out. Let's just stick to humans now. Not only when I, so let's say you go and record from my motor cortex, premotor cortex. There's a neuron that fires when I reach out and grab a peanut. Some of the, my neurons, motor neurons, will also fire when I watch you reach out and grab a peanut, or bam, reach out and grab a peanut. Right? So these are called monkey see, monkey do neurons, because they originally discovered in monkeys. Also, they're also called mirror neurons. And this is ex very exciting because what this neuron is doing is saying that person, the same neuron is firing as would fire if I were to reach out and grab a peanut. So that person's intention is to go reach out and grab a peanut. He's about to do it. So it's a mind-reading neuron. It's creating a virtual reality simulation of the other person's mind or brain in my brain to, to allow you to read that person's intention and predict that person's behavior. It's called theory of mind, which humans are, excel at in trying to judge each other's social behavior. So that set of neurons carries vast implications, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Now, there have been brain imaging studies showing the existence of these neurons in humans. But later, people find you also have sensory mirror neurons. What I just told you about is motor mirror neurons. There are also sensory mirror neurons in the somatosensory cortex, the cortex I was just telling you about, which receives touch signals and pain signals and everything from the rest of your body, represented in the postcentral gyrus in a map. So these neurons will fire in my postcentral gyrus. If somebody touches my left hand, a particular neuron will fire. Left elbow, another neuron will fire. There's a complete map of the left side of my body on the left, right side of my brain. 
You can see the map there. It's a cross-section through the brain. Complete map. Now, what Rizzolatti and other groups have found is, more recently, about five years ago, some of these so-called sensory neurons, touch neurons, which fire when somebody touches me, will fire when I watch Suresh being touched. Will fire when, when I simply watch somebody else being touched. This is radical, because when you think of the brain as specific centers responding to specific sensations, here's something that you, again, saying, the neuron is saying, to put it metaphorically, or informing higher centers in the brain. Look, the same thing is happening to Diane as would happen to you if you were touched. Therefore, empathize with Diane, she's being touched and stroked. Don't feel a touch of stroke, that would be silly, but empathize and understand what's going on in my mind. So it's again constructing a virtual reality simulation of her mind, her sensations in my mind. Now this raised an interesting question in my mind. If the mirror neuron, set of neurons, don't know the difference between me being touched and watching somebody else being touched, Diane being touched, how come I don't literally feel her sensation? Somebody touches her, this neuron is firing, same neuron fires when somebody touches me, how come I don't feel her touch every time somebody touches her? Right? Well, I reason, one reason for this might be I have my skin intact, and it's signaling to the other non-mirror neuron touch, touch neurons, look, you're not being touched. So that's vetoing the mirror neuron output, saying, empathize by all means. Somebody's doing to her the same thing that they would be doing to you if you were touched. But don't dissolve into her. Don't actually start feeling her sensations, because that would be idiotic. I'm speaking in metaphor, of course. All that is going on. Now, how do you test this? Well, if somebody were to amputate me, removing the sensory signals, and then I watch Diane being touched, I should literally start feeling her sensations. So anybody who's got a missing arm, watches anybody here in the audience being touched and stroked, should feel it in their phantom arm, quite literally. Not merely empathize, but literally feel it in their phantom arm. Now, astonishingly, phantom limbs have been known for 150 years, and nobody asks the simple question of saying, what if a person with a phantom limb watches somebody being touched? We tested three or four patients who first came to our lab, and the majority of them, in fact, three out of four, said, my God, this is astonishing. When I ca pay careful attention to the person being stroked and the same arm as my amputated arm, I literally feel the stroke and the touch. This is absolutely amazing, doctor. I've never seen this before. Uh, have you not noticed it? Well, things I feel, sensations in my phantom all the time. I'm not trying to correlate it to what's going on outside. But now that I'm paying attention, it's very clear when you're touching yourself, stroking yourself, I feel it in my phantom. Now, these mirror neurons have two implications. One is, well, they're just fun, and it's amazing to see this for the first time, but out of scientific curiosity. But there's also clinical implications. The first patient we did this on has excruciating phantom pain. This is something you see in the clinic in patients with phantom limbs. Their hand goes into a clenching spasm, there's an excruciating cramp, and they can't do anything about it because you can't massage a, a phantom. Right? <laughs> it's not there. So this guy went home and asked her wife to massage herself, her own hand, while he watched her. And he received a phantom massage and claimed that the phantom pain went away. And he phoned me all excited, saying for the first time in 10 years, he used to watch his wife massage her appropriate uh, corresponding arm, and his pain went away. So now we've initiated clinical trials to explore this further. You, most of you know about my mirror box technique, which I won't go into for treating phantom pain, but this may be another potential treatment for phantom pain. The second thing which is interesting about phantom limbs, sorry, about mirror neurons, uh, is the theoretical uh, implication of this. So I said it's involved in mind reading, it's involved in creating virtual reality. All of this is important for imitation as well. Right? When I'm trying to emulate or Im imitate some complex skill, like you're trying to haft a, a stone uh, axe head onto a, onto a uh, handle, a throat, I watch it and I do the same thing. So this requires my simulating your actions, putting myself in your shoes and taking an allocentric view of the world and simulating your actions. So this is critical to imitation. You say, well, so what's the big deal about imitation? I mean, you, in fact, you, you speak of people engaging in mockery or imitation. It's a derogatory term. But in fact, it's not true. Imitation is, the vit is absolutely vital for the transmission of culture. When early hominids were evolving, early homo sapiens were evolving, we started creating tools, tool uses very early, right? maybe mil a couple of million years ago. And then we started creating shelters, started killing animals using their fur as coats, and, and then dawn of language, and many aspects of culture, shelter, creating shelters, all of this. If this uh, the discovery of fire, for example, is an, is an amazing thing. All of this, if it's just one of a kind discovery by one amazingly inventive genius, uh, Homo erectus, it would disappear immediately. Because that guy would discover it, nobody would know how to imitate it. But with the advent of mirror neurons, and a sophisticated mirror neuron system hooked up to other brain regions, imitation learning become, became very, very sophisticated in humans. Therefore, 
So look at this. Therefore, the, the result of this is evolution suddenly became Lamarckian instead of Darwinian, right? If, you, if a polar bear wants to invent a fur coat, it's taken a half a million years to do so through laborious process of natural selection. Right? Now, the human child uh, watches his mother attacking, hunting down, or two or three mothers hunting down a polar bear and skinning her and wearing a coat, learns it in one generation. So it gets passed down in one generation and horizontally as well as vertically. And this is the beginning of imitation, beginning of culture and cultural assimilation of knowledge. So far from being some sort of academic curiosity, mirror neurons have a tremendous impact for the origins of human civilization and culture. I'm not saying that's the only thing that's creating culture, obviously not, but it's one key component in the gen genesis of culture. Now, I think I've talked enough about neurology. I'll just say, as I said, I'm not a uh, social scientist or a historian, but I will say a few words about implications of all this for, uh, for culture and all of that. Now, we've talked about, about the clinical implications of mirror neurons, treating phantom pain and stroke paralysis. We talked about empathy, and we talked about how removing the skin or the arm actually makes you feel other people's sensations and creates a syndrome we call hyper-empathy syndrome. So you actually empathize, over-empathize with other people. And it makes you wonder whether sociopathic individuals have a deficient mirror neuron system, something we started studying, congenitally deficient mirror neuron system. And the spectrum of empathy you see in normal people may depend on the level of activity of mirror neurons. In fact, we have suggested autistic children may have, in, may have an impoverished mirror neuron system. We're testing this idea. And conversely, highly empathetic people like Gandhi I'm not saying this explains Gandhi, but may have an excess of mirror neurons in the brain, which makes them hyper-empathetic to people. And this is, of course, a good thing. It's not a syndrome. And I wish we could all cultivate it. Now, um, in terms of culture and civilization, of course, it's one of the things that makes us quintessentially human, is culture. And there are rudiments of culture in many other primates, but it's especially well-developed in humans. And if I may say so somewhat jingoistically, India should be proud of her cultural heritage going back to Indus Valley civilization. And uh, many people think of Indian culture, they think, well, we invented, well, some people think it's curry and uh, cow worship and things like that, but that those, are, those days are long gone. But even now people say, well, India, well, they discovered zero. Well, that's partly true, but that's not all they did. Uh, if you think of, you just think of mathematics and numbers, the entire number system was invented in India around the first millennium, first, second half of the first millennium BC. We don't know exactly who did it or there's a group of people. It's not just zero, and you would appreciate this as a historian, historian of science. Maybe you already, I'm sure you already know this. But it's a place value system. So if you say 565, 5 is multiplied by 100, 6 is multiplied by 10, and uh, 5 is multiplied by 1. And then 5, 0 for 505, the middle place value. So the, the value of the number is determined by its location, by its place. That place value system completely revolutionized representation of numbers. If you look at Greek, Arithmetic, for example, to write 565 or 7622, you take an entire sheet of paper or an entire wall with the standard Greek terminology. So, so there's a place value, then there's use of zero to denote nothing, and use it as a placeholder. So if it's 505, it's 10 multiplied by zero. So it's used as a placeholder as well. So zero is a symbol for nothing, zero is a placeholder, place value, and independent symbols for the 10 numbers, and using base 10. So all of these things had to come together, become confluent to create the number system. And Einstein described this as the single greatest achievement of the human mind, the invention of arithmetic, the invention of numbers. So I could go on and on and talk about the origins of chess, uh, the origins of grammar and linguistics with Panini in the first millennium. But this is not a lesson on Indian history. I touched on, I just briefly mentioned Gandhi. I told you a little bit about how things like empathy and culture might evolve from the activity of nerve cells in the brain. Um, and I also want to conclude by saying, well, congratulating all the scholars who are getting awards today, but also conclude by saying we are very fortunate as Indian Americans to be living in a country which is tremendously not just tolerant of other cultures and other cultural influences and countries and, and civilizations, but also celebrates diversity in many ways. And I think we're indeed fortunate to have escaped, despite all the cultural sophistication of India, when we grew up 30, 40 years ago there in India, I'm revealing my age here, uh, it was stifling in terms of bureaucracy, and in terms of adhering to the dead weight of tradition. But by the way, in speaking of tradition, there's good and there's bad. I'm stating the obvious. There's a lot of good that comes out of tradition, too. This is something that the younger generation needs to understand. 
In India, we have a tradition, as many of you know, if you accidentally step on a book, if you step aside and you touch the book and you do this, because you're touching the goddess of learning, Saraswati. Right? This may seem like a silly superstition to most people, but in fact, it's profound. It's saying that you're, you're just t t telling something about your reverence for culture, for, for learning and knowledge. It's a symbol, and without symbols, the human brain is nothing. It's the same as a monkey brain. So this is telling you something very important about the role of symbols in the human brain. So as I said, we are fortunate to be here, and I want to uh, thank everybody for inviting me. Thank you. So uh, let me welcome you. I'm Ramesh Rao. I'm a professor here at UCSD, and I direct this uh, campus's uh, activity here on looking at the applications of telecommunications and information technology. A little bit later today, when uh, we have the reception outside, we'll turn on some of uh, the high technology gear that we have right here in this room, so we'll get some sense of uh, what really goes on here. Some of you have been here before, and perhaps you've heard me from a few years ago talk about the extraordinarily experimental work that faculty here at UCSD undertake. Uh, origin of this campus is basically science and it permeates every discipline. And one of the things that I was astonished uh, myself after I stepped into this role was this whole uh, field of electronic civil disobedience. A few years ago, it seemed like a real curiosity. How could one actually take advantage of the internet and things like text messaging and things like distributed denial of service attacks to have a cyber sit-in, you know? Uh, how do you do the harana, if you wish, in cyberspace? That seemed uh, like a far-fetched notion. But we actually have a professor here at UCSD who works uh, here in this building, uh, who many of us uh, uh, are painfully aware of, uh, <laughs> because he does push the envelope, just like Gandhi did, uh, and uh, draws attention to causes. So where, where does one go to learn how to do civil disobedience? Universities have a role to play there. Uh, the reading of the essays that the students submit as part of the scholarship is really the highlight of my own involvement. Uh, those of you that know Madhu know very well that when he comes and asks you to do something for him, you just say, yes, sir. Uh, he's very persistent, very determined, and uh, the cause that he chases after is really noble. Uh, so it, many people contribute to uh, what he asks us to do, but I have to personally say that I get back uh, my investment in time, really, by reading the essays the students write. And I think we have two of our students reading their essays. I will say, uh, notwithstanding Wikipedia, that uh, perhaps those of us with uh, some background, who perhaps uh, have spent some time in India, grew up in India in my case, have a role to play in perhaps articulating more clearly what nonviolence means. Okay, uh, it isn't just turning the other cheek. Uh, it's being provocative in some ways. It's being able to address a cause that can't be addressed in any other way. And like I was saying, all these things sound kind of abstract. Uh, but look at what happened, uh, as uh, Congressman Bob Filler mentioned, the Arab Spring, right? Quite literally, it was uh, at some level a Twitter revolution, right? Uh, the profound effect that people can have uh, through extremely simple mechanisms like scraping salt off uh, the coast uh, in challenging authority, it's uh, becoming more and more meaningful. So again, uh, I don't think we knew 11 years ago when Cal IT2 got going if information technology was going to have a role in uh, regime change. Uh, you know, I mean, there it is. Uh, so in keeping with the times, we have finally created a social media website, a little too late for this year's round. Uh, so in the future, applicants to this program will be able to not only do the obvious, like upload their material, but we'll make it available for a broader audience. Those of you that have not, the rest, uh, not read the essays have really missed out on learning what it's like to grow up in San Diego County, what it's like to think of what education can do uh, to open up opportunities. And so we are hoping that uh, we'll, we'll make this uh, more broadly accessible. So um, we have a selection of uh, students here who have actually won the awards, and we have a couple that received honorable mentions. Uh, we have certificates here. And I'm going to call out the names of the winners. Uh, and they will receive the awards uh, from Rama. 
Uh, and then we have a photographer. Perhaps the parents will also like to take pictures, uh, but certainly we have an official photographer and all the pictures will be made available. And then that will be followed by the presentation of the AVID scholars that we'll call on uh, Congressman Bob Filner uh, to do. So Prithvi Undavali. Next up, Alexandre Sami. run out of luck in being able to pronounce these names correctly, but uh, Nitish Padmanavan, this one I can do. <laughs> Sri Charita, not here. Ali Morgan. <laughs> Kenny Hua. Shreya Carey. <laughs> and the two honorable mentions, uh, Gloria Cayallo. Angelina. Oh, Angelina Shamu. Uh, San Diego Indian American Society institutes, instituted the achievement via individual determination, or AVID Awards, in 2004. Dr. P.K. Patel, who is sitting here somewhere in the back, was instrumental in setting up a cooperative agreement with the San Diego County Office of Education. These awards are funded by voluntary member contributions. Award winners receive 
uh, $1,000 annually. The scholarship is renewable up to four years, contingent upon students' academic performance. In selecting the awardees, we give preference to students who are first in their family to go to college. Other criteria include academic achievement, participation in community activities, and financial need. Since 2004, this, we have awarded 28 scholarships. This year, we are giving four awards. All four of our students this year are outstanding scholars and student leaders. It's a privilege to be able to help these young, talented people achieve their potential. I'll now introduce the 2011 awardees. And uh, when I call your name, please come to the stage. Samantha Davidson graduated from El Capitan High, Lakeside, <laughs> and plans to major in environmental science at Northern Arizona University. I'd like to read a little bit from her application. She wrote, being the oldest child in a household of retired law enforcement officers had its ups and downs, but in the end, the structure and discipline they instilled allowed me to become a strong, independent person. I always tried to set a good example for my younger sister by doing well in school in involving in various activities that my family could be proud of. Congratulations. <laughs> Our second awardee is Brenda Guillermo. Is she, is she here or? Uh, she is a graduate of Glen High School and plans to study biology at the University of California at Merced. While in high school, she provided care for her terminally ill mother. In her essay, she wrote, my father told me that life is not easy, but anything is possible as long as we are willing to sacrifice. Uh, my congr congratulations to Brenda. We'll make sure that she gets her award. Uh, <laughs> Joe Mejia from El Camino High in Oceanside will be majoring in chemistry at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, he stated in his essay, never would I have, I have imagined that I could be transformed from a withdrawn kid at school to someone who appreciates and enjoys interacting with others. One day I'll become an educator, helping others to overcome their adversities, hoping that my life on earth will not have been ill spent. Congratulations. Thank you. Our final scholar this year is Tan Nguyen from Kearney School of International Business. She'll be majoring in biochemistry at UCSD's Marshall College. Uh, she stated in her essay, my childhood was filled with schoolwork and my purpose has been single-minded to graduate from college and support my family financially. Uh, she couldn't be here today, but our congratulations to her and we'll make sure she gets her award. So we have two essays coming up. Uh, Prithvi Handavali will read his essay on nonviolence. Hello, uh, my name is Prithvi. I graduated from Torrey Pines High School. Um, it's really an honor to be up here as well as um, to be considered for this award. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank the uh, committee for taking their time to consider me. 
It is, difficult to, it is difficult for us to envision a society where the people forego their natural instinct. Sorry. Imagine a society without thirst or hunger, without need or wants. Is it possible to ask all members of a community to forego a natural human instinct, even if it opposed, even if, even when opposed and agitated? Even though we may call ourselves civilized, our basic anatomy is that of an animal. We naturally respond with violence when threatened or attacked. Is, the vi is violence a human instinct or a human need? Can each member of a community, society, or even the world control and suppress their natural urges? Can we remain nonviolent while pursuing our ambitions as individuals and as a society? The possibility of co coexistence of nonviolence and, in and innate human nature raises some interesting and fascinating questions. Needless to say, many notorious leaders have been successful in their goals without nonviolence, namely Gandhi and Martin Luther King. It is apparent that regardless of the goal, with perseverance and focus, tyrannical and martial regimes were able to be successfully conquered, pervasive social norms were destroyed and reconstructed. However, it would be a gross misstatement to claim that these, res these resistance movements as a whole were fully peaceful. During Martin Luther King's period, the prominent leader Ma Malcolm X sought to arm black civilians, and the Black Panthers, orga the Black Panther organization, used violence to protect African Americans and to intimidate law enforcement. The Indian Independence, independence Movement had numerous but stray incidents of armed rebellion. It is the natural human urge to respond violently when attacked and violated. Yet nonviolent protests are much more fruitful. The Black Panther movement was soon crushed by the government due to its illegal activities, and the few armed rebellions in India were more or less useless against British military might. The success of the few activities paled in comparison to the nonviolent protests. With peaceful protests, instead of choosing to exert their physical might, they sought to exert their mental solidarity. Throughout history, it has been shown that eradicating an ide ideology is much more difficult than controlling and removing an agitated or violent group. The use of peaceful protests ensures not only the solidarity and strong ide ideologies perpetuated in its supporters, but it also prevents opponents from using the group's violent or Ill illegal actions against them. Malcolm X's movements were not only met with more aggression and racial seg seg regulation, but Martin Luther King's movements were met with support from both black and white supporters. MLK's nonviolent movements appealed to the emotions and reasons while violent resistance was merely a useless show of might. It is clear that in order to win a war or battle, one must first conquer the mind. An army can easily, removed an, easily remove an armed insurrection, yet no amount of justice could ever eradicate an idea of justice or equality. Perpetuating these social ideologies is what is successful to reformation. reformation. Inevitably, some of society may not be unable to control their human nature, but by convey conveying ideals of peace and solidarity, it is possible to win a majority of humans into following the ideals of morality. Second one will be Angelica Shamu. Hello. Uh, first of all, I would start. I would like to start by um, thanking everyone in this room for being here and for. Um, helping us um, with your donations for us to get through college. And I, I graduated from Escondido High School, so thank you. So this is my essay. If we plant the seed of violence, it will slowly but surely grow, in, grow into an ominous being. Its uncontrollable veins will begin to control its surroundings. Its thorns causes pain among those who come in cont contact with it. What was once a seed is now a monstrosity. Violence can take control of an individual body, body, bodies. It uses human force to acquire its desired purpose. Violence leads to chaos, chaos and loss of human reasoning. 
Many past great leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., Cesar Chavez, and Mahatma Gandhi knew all these things, and that is why they called for nonviolence. Cesar Chavez, one of these great leaders, knew what violence was capable of doing to his society. When he began his plan to fight for justice, he wanted to plant the seed of peace. He knew that this plant would eventually lead to the growth of something new, a rebirth among society. Cesar Chavez had one goal, and it was to give the migrant workers their basic human rights. Cesar Chavez saw, saw the injustice and pain brought upon the migrant workers. He dug deep to find the roots of the problem. He wanted to weed the injustice that was once planted. Cesar Chavez started by forming the National Farm Workers Association. He essentially began by trying to bring people together. This was his first step towards his fight for justice. Cesar Chavez saw the way pesticides were being poured, poured onto the migrant workers in the fields. They were like bugs on soil. Cesar Chavez, along with others, went on strike. Despite the maliciousness of, of many, he called for nonviolence at, at all his events. He knew that violence destroys our morals, morals or purpose of life. When we, begin, be, when we begin to lash out against other individuals, it dehumanizes us. It causes social problems, and we begin to lose communication. Cesar Chavez did boycotts, pilgrimages, pilgrimages and even a 20-day fa fast for his cause. He, he accomplished what many cannot do using nonviolence. Despite being treated as less than humans, migrant workers do not allow themselves to fo follow the growers' examples. Nonviolence is a bigger struggle. It demands more internal strength than violence. It demands restraint from those who have lived injustices and pain. It makes you an intellectual being. Cesar Chavez had to be a creative problem solver as he was dealing with this situation. He had to be a leader and influence those that were around him. He, he had to overcome all these barriers, barriers all while, while maintaining restraint. His example is followed by many worldwide. The movement that began in the small town of Delano, California, made a major impact on the world. This movement created a unity among people from all cultural backgrounds. Strangers united and took a different action to get a different result. Many were soon united by the seed of peace that was planted. Nonviolence gives us a purpose of life. We are given rebirth. When we are joined by nonviolence, many magnificent things begin to happen. It is like we are all suddenly brothers and sisters. People like Cesar Chavez and Gandhi show the world that freedom and justice can be acquired through respect for others, not ignoring the problem, but doing something about it in a peaceful way. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here today and joining us for this wonderful event. Uh, I just wanted to express the society's uh, gratitude for all the people who support our program. We acknowledge the support for this program provided by Congressman Bob Filner, the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology and Ramesh Rao at UCSD, Hema and Kiran Mazumdar, Firoz and Suresh Subramani, Bonnie and Krishna Arora, Kanta and P.K. Patel, Francois and Salim Shah, Nacha and Madhu Madhavan, Lata and Ashok Israni, Purna and Gopa Patnaik, Aruna and Subodh Garg, Niru and Subal Goswami, Sejal Parikh, Meera and M.C. Venkatesh, Sudha and Srinivas Prabha, Raj and Viji Pratha, Mahesh Kumar, Anu and Nachi Madhavan, Alka and Raj Kanya, Sridhar Venkatesh, Somel Shah, Hema and Bharat Lal. Thank you all for your support. I'd also like to thank Gayatri Prahlad and her family for being with us today. As you all know, CK Prahlad was our previous president of the society, and we lost him about a year ago. But I'm so gl glad that Gayatri and Deepa and Ashwin and of course Arjun could all come here today. 
I'd also like to thank Ms. Nancy Marlin, who's the provost at SDSU, for her support and for being with us today. And of course, our chief guest and speaker for the memorial lecture, Professor V.S. Subramaniam Ramachandran. How could I do that? I am so sorry. Okay. So we honor his father and Professor V.S. Ramachandran. Which part of my brain didn't function right? <laughs> and, um, and his wife, Diane, for being with us today. I'd like to request all the scholarship winners and the committee members to please I know I thanked him first, <laughs> but I'll thank you again, Congressman Bob Filner. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you for being here. And of course, uh, for all these years, you have given those uh, certificates to our scholarship award winners. And this time is the first time I've actually seen you here giving them away. So thank you again. Um, I'd like to have all the scholarship winners come on the stage so that they can have their pictures taken as well as the committee members. So if you could all join us, be good, and we could do that quickly. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Okay, there's a reception, there's some food, so please come after the pictures and join us there. Thank you.